So welcome everybody. This is our June Kids Comics launch and we have four amazing speakers who are here to be sh to share their brand new graphic novels with you. So first of all, we have, um, I'm gonna talk, say, introduce you in the order of Zoom boxes that I have on my screen. So um, Kat Fajardo is here to talk about Miss Quinces, which, is come, which just came out from Scholastic Graphics. And then we have um, Bingling Hu, who is here to talk about Expedition Backyard, which just came out from Random House Graphic. And Bingling is the illustrator. And then we have Louis Stowell, who is here to talk about Loki, a bad God's guide to being good. <laughs> That's like a tongue twister. Snappy. <laughs> <laughs> um, which just came out from Candlewick. And then Rosemary Mosco, who is the writer of Expedition Backyard that just came out from uh, Random House Graphic. So first of all, the question that I always ask each of you panelists is just tell us about the book. Give us a little spiel about what it's about, what kind of readers you're reaching with that book. So we can start with you, Kat, and then go, I'll introduce you in order of Zoom screens. Oh, awesome. Uh, well, yeah, so Miss Keen Sis is my uh, middle grade graphic novel um, about a young girl named Sue who would rather do anything else than celebrate her own quinceanera. Um, Sue is just like any other nerdy 15 year old tomboy. All she wants to do is spend summer vacation reading, making comics, and spending time with her friends at sleepaway camp. And unfortunately, that doesn't happen for her. Um, instead, she gets uh, sent on a family trip to Honduras um, alongside her parents and two annoying sisters and they live out way in the country which means no cable tv no uh you know cell phone service no internet which is like a nightmare for a teen like sue um and to make matters worse her mom suddenly announces that the family is going to throw her a surprise quinceanera which is not what she signed up for <laughs> so yeah the uh the story is just like a uh, oh, and, and the two, uh, her mom and Sue, um, strike a deal. If Sue were to continue with the quinceanera planning for her family, then she is able to go to sleepaway camp with her friends. Um, but whether or not she, you know, can be able to hold her end of the bargain or not, um, it's, it's a very funny uh, story about just like finding yourself within two cultures and, you know, feeling like an outsider within your own family and kind of finding uh, your identity in, in all that and, you know, um, wearing it as a tiara, like, like, you know, like a tiara on your head. So mm -hmm. um, it's a, it's a very fun story. It's very close to my heart because it's based on my own experience as a quinceanera and a very reluctant one at that. So uh, yeah, I'm just excited for people to read it. I was wondering, I was going to actually ask you, is, is there any element of autobiographical elements in this, but you oh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> okay, yeah. um, Bingling and Rosemary, could you tell us a little bit about Expedition Backyard? Sure. Uh, Rosemary, do you want to start off? Sure, yeah. Um, so this is our book, Expedition Backyard. It's, um, so it's about some uh, little rodent characters who are um, kind of uh, accidentally moved from the country to the city and they're really into nature and exploring and they have to discover a whole new world of nature and what's around them. And so it's about finding nature wherever you go. So I've always lived in cities and there's a lot of incredible nature here. So it's about connecting with the nature that's really close to you as opposed to you know the nature that you might see on TV and it's a story of friendship and there's a lot of kind of science content. I'm a science writer and a naturalist so that's kind of my background. So um yeah and then I and then I needed someone like Bingling to make it you know cute and um very personable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I uh so a lot of the work that I do even separate from my work on Expedition Backyard is kind of at that intersection of art and science. Uh, currently my day job is graphic design at an aquarium. And like usually it's boring stuff like posters and flyers, but every now and then I do get to make illustrations that kind of encourage people or teach people how to compost or recycle or like how to recognize um, local wildlife. So Expedition Backyard was really nice because 
it was kind of along the same vein of work that I've already been doing, but geared towards kids. And because it's geared towards kids, it can be a lot more fun and silly. Oh my gosh, that's awesome. I There might be some follow-up questions for you, Bingling, about how you balance your day job and your comics work, I have a feeling, but we'll get to that later. <laughs> All right, um, Louie Stoll, do you wanna tell us about Loki? Yeah, so Loki is, I guess, a hybrid novel, graphic novel. It's got a mix of comics, doodles, and text. Um, this is it. And it's it's sort of, I always pitch it differently every time I talk about it. But it's this time I'm going to say it's big in reverse with Norse gods. So basically the Norse god Loki, um, who's the god of mischief, always getting into trouble, causing trouble for other people, has been punished by being sent down to earth in the form of a mortal child. So he has to both adapt to mortal life and child life. Um, and it's sort of a story about how to learn to be good and finding your family, but it's also a story about butt jokes. <laughs> <laughs> Did you say butt jokes or bug jokes? But. but. <laughs> I would okay. say bum, but I'm talking to an American audience. So. <laughs> I had to clarify. <laughs> uh, though Loki is a shapeshifter, so there's some moments where he does turn into a bug. Oh, okay, excellent. Bug and butt joke. <laughs> So, okay, now comes the question that I really enjoy asking creators like all of you. Um, how did you get started? Like what made you wanna do what you're doing um, with creating comics for kids in the first place? Kat, why don't you start? Oh, okay. Um, I have always loved reading comics. Um, just like I was just surrounded by comics in general. My older sister used to pass down her Archie Digest comics to me. So that was like my first exposure to American comics. Um, I started picking up manga um, in middle school and high school, and I was just obsessed with that. So uh, it was always like a, you know, I, I loved reading um, like comics in general. And it wasn't until, uh, you know, senior year of high school, I was trying to decide what I wanted to do because I ultimately I've always wanted to be an artist, but I, I didn't know what at the moment. Like I was a fine arts major in my high school, so I had no idea what I wanted to do for college. And so it wasn't until um, one of my daily hangouts after school at Barnes and Nobles that uh, they started expanding their graphic novel section uh, around that time. And so I came across a, a graphic novel called um, The Education of Hopi Glass by Jaime Hernandez. And that completely changed my world. I was just like, what is this? Uh, these characters are so relatable and likable. And at the time, like I was like a punk kid. I was like Latina. So I'm just like, this calls out to me in so many ways. And, and it was so beautiful and it re reminded me of the Archie comics I grew up like aesthetically. So uh, I was just like, how do you make this? I, I, you know, I knew how to make comics. Like I, I've done like one page comics before but nothing like a whole book. And so I'm just like, how do I learn how to do this? And so that's when I applied to uh, the School of Visual Arts in New York City. And that's when I started learning how to make comics, um, you know, taught by, uh, educators that have experience in the comics industry. So um, editors, uh, artists, writers. And so from there on, I kind of began my journey into like comics and making my own uh, like zines um, right after. And so, yeah, it just, uh, I guess, yeah, I guess a life kind of just, you know, like a river just kind of made me flow that direction anyway. So, yeah. I love that story. I, I feel like I had a single book that changed my trajectory and pushed me into graphic novels as well, which was Blankets by Craig Thompson. So uh, yep, yeah, yep. it's yep. so amazing how one book can like really impact you so much. Absolutely. Our, <laughs> um, Binglin, can you talk about how, how did you end up doing what you're doing? Sure. So uh, like I said, I um, currently my day job is graphic design, but my heart is still in illustration and comics. And when I was a kid, I also like 100% grew up with manga. I think I think Inuyasha was my first one, which I started reading when I was like seven, which maybe is a little too young for that. <laughs> but <laughs> just it, it was just really amazing kind of reading about all these like monsters and and, just girls falling into adventures and that kind of thing. And 
I, I got my start in comics by just like literally copying the comic panels that I liked from, from Inuyasha or Bleach or Naruto or whatever. <laughs> and that kind of, uh, I kind of grew from that into making my own autobio comics um, just in my sketchbook, like the kind of, in, in Japanese comics, it's called four coma style, which is just like four panels top to bottom. And it's usually like a quick, very short comedy, very quick punchline. So I kind of got my start doing that with just little jokes that I experienced through throughout my childhood. And uh, throughout college, I started making my own zines too. Um, I actually worked at my school campus's uh, post office, which doubled as the campus's printer. Um, so as an employee, I got free printing. <laughs> so I printed so many zines in my three, four years working there. And I think having the access to print and distribute as many zines as I wanted really helped me enjoy it a lot more. I feel like I probably wouldn't have been able to enjoy it as much if I didn't have the ability to like just make stuff for free. I think I, I do owe a lot of a lot of my start to accessing a print shop for zero money. I was getting paid to use it actually. <laughs> so um, Expedition Backyard is my first graphic novel and it's my first time making a comic of this length. I think prior to this, the longest comics I ever made were maybe four pages tops. So it is a pretty big jump to go from a four or five page comic to something like this, which I think is 112 pages. <laughs> so that there was a big learning curve there, but um, yeah, I think manga and indie zines is where I got my start for sure. I have a feeling some people might ask you about um how that was going from four pages all the way up to 112 because I know there's people here who are trying to make that jump themselves but just one quick follow-up question was your job at the print shop like premeditated like you you said to yourself, <laughs> I'm gonna get a job at that place so I have free, free or, or was it serendipity like you started working there and then you realized that you could do that it's a fair question I actually so at my college, I would say that at least when I was there, the it was it's called uh, Postal and Print. I feel like Postal and Print was kind of infamous for being the place where the indie illustrators try to get a job from, <laughs> because almost all of my student coworkers there were illustration majors. Who um, <laughs> not not all of them were making zines, but I think the free printing definitely appealed to a lot of us and <laughs> it was just kind of it was kind of just a, a very simple uh not super fancy digital press like we had a separate print shop that had like the fancy paper and the like you can print it three feet wide that kind of thing uh, at postal and print it was just like 11 by 17 at the biggest size um, but i i definitely oh Sorry if you can hear that cat. <laughs> um, so when I started going to school there, I did notice that a lot of the cartoonists that I looked up to that I knew were current students were working there. And I was like, I wonder why everyone that I look up to works at Postal and Print. And then I learned that they get free printing. So I was like, okay, I'm going to try to get a job here. <laughs> That's what I did too in my school. I applied for the like the library position because they had photocopiers. So <laughs> that rules. <laughs> yeah. All right, Rosemary. Um, what was your journey into writing graphic novels? Yeah, it's been kind of circuitous. Um, so I was also I have parrots. They are as far away from me as they can be in the house. But if you occasionally hear them. I apologize. Uh, they have so many treats, but screaming is their favorite activity. Um, yeah, hi. So I, uh, so I grew up um, just really into science and art, and I uh, read a lot of newspaper comics too. So I just filled scrapbooks with endless newspaper comics, pretty much all just Bloom County and Farside ripoffs 
just, you know, endlessly. Like I found one recently and it had jokes about like ace of base, like <laughs> it's very old stuff. <laughs> um, but I just was, I, I just had all these different interests and I honestly felt really sort of out of place and like, I could not figure out what to do with all of these things. So I figured by the time I get to college, I'd have to pick one. And sure enough, by the time I got to college, I said, you know, what can I do this interdisciplinary? And they said nothing. So I sort of stumbled through it anthropology degree and took a lot of years off and kind of wandered around and made a lot of zines um, too. I had to go to Kinko's though and actually get them done there. It was up in Canada, so it was less less fun. I fought with them a lot about print, print quality and stuff. I had my own stapler though. Someone gave me that, my big Stanley Bostitch stapler. But uh, yeah, I just sort of, I, I read once this um, science communicator saying, that her career path was sort of like a thermophilic bacterium. They can't see the big picture, but they move towards areas that are of greater warmth. And I feel like that's sort of what I've done. So I've kind of weaved through all kinds of different jobs. Um, so I got a, a master's doing science writing and that kind of stuff. And then, um, yeah, I was working for a nonprofit when I got an option to do a book through for a second. It was about space, which I know nothing about, but I said, okay, I'm going to do this and uh, just jumped into that. And so I mostly write um, just pure prose books, but this was kind of an exciting opportunity. And also I've been making cartoons the whole time under the name Bird and Moon doing nature cartoons, just always on the side. Um, so doing it not on the side is new for me, but yeah, thermophilic bacterium, that's me <laughs> just kind of blundering around. Yeah. I'm not going to ask you how to spell that. <laughs> <laughs> Thermophilic just means th thermo like like heat and then philo yeah. like helia like loving. So you're just kind of like moving towards the thing that you love. That's warm. Yes, that's a great metaphor for all of us. I'm sure. <laughs> okay, Louis, what's your story? So um, I grew up in British comics. So um, there was this... I think I'm a bit older than the rest of the panel and there was a great kind of surge of children's comics in the 1980s when I was a kid. Um, and I think what drew me to doing comics for children now was that I feel like kids today, until quite recently, haven't had that same amazing cornucopia of comics, as particularly in the UK, because I think America's way ahead of us on that. Um, so I grew up reading this amazing comic called Oink, which was satire for children. And I think that's quite the angle I come at, you know, it's that kind of satirical angle, um, because I feel like you don't just suddenly start finding that sort of thing funny when you're 25. You actually you do have that kind of instinct to puncture the powerful from quite a young age. So with Loki, I had an opportunity to do that in quite a stealth way because he's a, you know, a god learning to be a person. Um, so he's got this little guide to what it's like to be on on earth um and it's just basically me being sassy about politics but um in <laughs> in the voice of an Norse god um but yeah so i i started off writing books with just words or or pictures by someone else and this is actually my first book as as the illustrator um but i've always done comics so i study english but i did um comics for the for the school newspaper that kind of thing um and then I did comics for like business magazines and all these kind of strange little little bits and bobs where it's always been quite short, you know, maybe two panel. Um, the longest I think I'd done was about, yeah, like four pages. Um, so making that leap, I mean, because be, because mine's not all kind of panel comics, it's a little bit less intense, um, but sort of realizing how slow that process is. I used to work in publishing and I was always like, oh, illustrators, it takes so long. And now I'm like, I, I understand why. <laughs> because <laughs> like writing is so much quicker <laughs> but um but I absolutely love it and I have that kind of like I think there's a joy in comics for children which they I think a lot of adults are so skeptical about and I feel I feel kind of sad for the kids where it's like I just want to say your children will gobble these up they will actually like dive into these worlds and love them and have no kind of fear or reluctance um but there is that fear and reluctance in the parents which I think is on, on a bit, I'm on a bit of a soapbox to overcome mm -hmm. um but yeah I think um I came to manga very late in life I haven't I didn't grow up with it particularly um but I went back to read kind of the old stuff because I'm quite a completist so I'm like mm -hmm. I'm gonna start in the 1940s <laughs> um, <laughs> um I think my favorite is probably Barefoot Jen um which is mm -hmm. 
definitely not for children, but I find my experience of reading as a child was reading stuff that was definitely not for children. So 2000 AD, which was kind of intensely ultra violent, and I read it at seven, and I loved it. <laughs> I remember finding D.H. Lawrence on my dad's bookshelf and reading that when I was like eight or seven years old. <laughs> um, anyway, so yeah. we're going to transition into questions from the audience soon. But before we do that, I have a question that I like to ask everybody because this is a question that all creators, I think, are who ha haven't yet, you know, gotten their first traditional book deal are very curious about, which is how did you get your agent? So who, who would like to go first answering that question? Oh, well. Okay. Um, which is how I got my agent singular is a very long story because I've had three. <laughs> um, so I, I really bumbled around for a very long time. Um, I mean, it took me like 18 years to get published from like very much the very start of trying to. Um, and, and I kind of like basically went through several agents that weren't quite right. Um, so um, basically the agent I went with in the end, I, um, she's called Molly, Molly Kerhorn. Um, she, she, she's more writers than illustrators, but um, basically I did a lot of research into like who the editors were scared of. <laughs> that was my main priority, um, but who the editors were scared of, but that I would not be scared of. Um, so it was, I did a lot of like asking around, um, cause I've got a lot of writer friends. So it's all kind of like basically because, you know, obviously you can do your home and get whatever kind of um, research online. There's a lot of stuff out there, but I just I quite like getting that sense of like, OK, but what do people really think? <laughs> um, so. So, yeah. And I think with the first agents, I, I did the kind of I'll just send stuff out to everyone cold. Um, but by that time, I was able to do a bit more kind of like, can you introduce me? So I think that kind of networking thing really kind of made a lot of difference for me. Um, and. Yeah, so I think that was that was my path to finding Molly, and she's a keeper. So, um, so I'm here for good. <laughs> awesome. Thanks so much. So, who wants to tell your the next agent story? Um, I, I oh, oh, oh. <laughs> thank you, Miss <laughs> Ray. Um, but mine was just a, a little bit more unconventional. Um, so instead of like applying to to like um, agencies and stuff. Uh, my agent actually found me. Um, her name is Linda Camacho. She's amazing. But uh, basically what it was that after college, um, I wasn't having a lot of luck with pitching my comics to like publishers. So whenever they had like um, portfolio reviews at Comic-Con and stuff, I would just always get a no or just bad reviews and stuff. So I'm like, okay, I was very disheartened by it. So I decided to um, self-published my own work um, online and in person. So I started creating zines that were autobiographical stuff um, about my identity as a Latina and queer person. And so from there on, I started posting my work online for free. And that is when my agent saw my work and then reached out to me. It's just like, hey, I want to work with you. Um, let's make this happen. And I had no idea about agents at the time. So I'm just like, this could probably be a good opportunity. We'll, we'll, we'll see, I'll, I'll, I'll like, you know, uh, scope it out for a bit. And, and if it doesn't work, then it doesn't work. And it's been like about like six years since we worked together. So um, yeah, and then because of her, I was able to get a lot of um, uh, like doors open within the, the publishing world. Cause I, I like initially did not think about making comics for kids. Um, that was not like my, on my like uh, plan, um, I was gonna just create adult comics and submit it to like indie publishers like Image or Dark Horse or something. So um, for her to like guide me in the process of creating, you know, book covers and, and um, graphic novels for, for children's um, publishing, uh, that was just like a whole new world. And she was an excellent guide in that sense. Um, so yeah, that was how I got my agent. Um, again, very unconventional, but it, it, it happens. It, yeah. Do you know where she found you online? Was it Twitter or Instagram? Yeah, it was, it was Twitter. Yeah. Twitter, okay. So Twitter is a good source. Twitter is uh -huh. great. I should post okay. more on there, but yeah. All right. I I, I think, oh, sorry. Yes, go ahead. Sorry. I just wanted to say um, that 
that story has happened to so many people I know actually the whole kind of being being found um, because I think the comics world and the publishing world aren't always very closely linked and I think but there's often those agents who are willing to go out there and look yeah yeah Makes sense. Yeah, bo yeah both of your stories I feel like I've heard kind of versions of those similar paths as well Rosemary how about you yeah, so another really weird story. <laughs> um, so I had been working in nonprofit for a while, um, nature related nonprofit when I got, so I had been um, doing my cartoons on the side uh, for something like 10 years at that point. And I um, was building up an online following partly because I was working in social media for nonprofits. So whatever I learned at work, I would kind of do for myself, which was odd. It's sort of like working in the print shop. It's like oddly, you know, I was stealing that stuff and doing all of those techniques. Um, and so first second had a book from their science series where they basically it had it hadn't worked out with I think two different writers for this one book. And they were sort of like desperate. They were like, we need someone to write this book in three months. Um, you know, we see you writing a lot online and we see your cartoons online. Um, and I knew some folks there, but I think the internet stuff really helped. So they reached out. So I did that book without an agent and uh, kind of used it as an excuse to quit my nonprofit, which had been kind of stressful. And then I thought, oh, shoot, I need a job now. So <laughs> I started kind of casting around and I had really enjoyed the book experience. Um, and uh someone I vaguely knew from publishing ages ago reached out from Workman to basically have me do what wasn't a work for hire, but was sort of a work for hire. Um, this book, uh, co-write a book for Atlas Obscura for kids. Um, and they saw that I could do a book. They saw that I'd done the first second. So I kind of got into it from sort of almost like a work for hire or writing for other people and not creating my own worlds. Um, standpoint. And so the thing is, when you have a book offer, agents are like, hey, that's free money for me. So I needed someone to negotiate the Atlas Obscura deal. And so a lot of my internet cartoon friends went with this guy named Seth Fishman, who's really great. Um, he knows how to explain to publishers that internet cartoons are real and a thing. I guess that's less of an issue now, but for a long time, it was a real challenge. So he kind of jumped on for that and he said, you know, I'll do this deal and then we can move forward if you want. And it's just been this really fruitful partnership since then. But I feel like a lot of people I know sort of have this dream and this idea and that's what they want to produce. And for me, it was just the process of writing was so fun. How do I keep doing this? So I sort of did some similar stuff. So it, again, it was just an accident <laughs> or, luck, or luck, I guess. Yeah, kind of weird. Thing. And he's incredible. He really... Um, he really uh, works to develop your career and so forth. I did have a couple other inquiries that did come from Twitter after signing mm -hmm. with him. So Twitter, I don't know if it still is, but was a was a source back in the day. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thanks. And what about you, Bing Ring? I, I had a pretty similar experience to Katz actually. My agent, uh, Susan Graham, reached out to me uh, in, I want to say three or maybe four years ago. Um, and they said that they found me through an indie project that I did, which um, I was wrestling around in my cabinets to look for. <laughs> but uh, this is a project that I uh, organized and kind of walked through uh, in my last year of college, maybe. But uh, it's called Zodiac, and it's an illustration anthology uh, celebrating the Eastern Zodiac and featuring uh, all Asian artists, uh, Asian and Pacific Islander artists. And um, it was just kind of a, I think actually, you know, it's been a few years, but I think this was actually a spite project <laughs> because I remember seeing a, a different project that was kind of like, it's been so long, but I think it was either a like Asian fairy tales anthology where none of the creators were Asian or like something similar along those lines where I was like, why? <laughs> so I, I thought to myself, I want, I think we can do better than that. I want to make something where it's, you know, for us, by us. So I reached out to a bunch of friends um, and we kind of uh, put together this book and 
um, I'm really, I'm still really proud of it. It's, I, uh, it's like all my beautiful friends and their beautiful artwork. <laughs> it cycles through the uh, Asian Zodiac three times and each artist kind of got their pick of which animal they would like to draw. Um, some people didn't have strong feelings on what they wanted to draw, but I did also ask what animal, an what animal do you absolutely never want to draw? A lot of people said, I don't want to draw monkeys and I don't want to draw horses. So <laughs> I kind of, you know, tried to assign uh, themes according to what people would enjoy or not hate the most. <laughs> but uh, this was a pretty big undertaking. Um, I almost feel like I wasn't 100% ready to do this, but it did happen somehow. And I, um, proud I funded the printing through pre-orders online and it got a good amount of attention and Susan saw it somehow. I have no idea how, if it was through Tumblr or Twitter or um, like, I did ask each of these 36 artists, like, please promote this as much as you can so that we can afford to print it. <laughs> so, you know, it could have been through any one of these sources, but uh, I did really appreciate them reaching out and being like, hey, let's, like, if you want to make books, let's make books together. Mm -hmm. What uh, crowdfunding platform did you use? Uh, I didn't use a platform. It was just, I'm pretty sure it was just Store Envy. So like mm -hmm. Store Envy, the, the platform, um, mm -hmm. I don't know what to call it, like mm -hmm. e-commerce platform. I just had mm -hmm. this like put up um, available for either digital or print, uh, print orders and mm -hmm. I took in pre-orders for maybe a month or two. And then once we reached the printing goal, mm -hmm. then all the funds afterwards, I was able to kind of split between everyone who participated. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's really cool. Is it still available? Or uh, not officially. I have like a bunch of prints that like, I haven't been doing conventions because of COVID and I kind mm -hmm. of don't plan to do conventions because of COVID. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I did also give all of the participating artists the print, like the print ready file. And I told them like, here's the printer I use, here's the paper stock I use, feel free to create more and sell for yourself if you want. Mm. Yeah. That's such a cool model. That's so interesting. Thanks. Yeah, I, I think I've been in a couple, like a handful of these similar kind of mini anthologies or big zines. Uh, like big collaborative zines and something that I always wish was an option was for everyone to be able to print their own and sell their own because uh, sometimes it's nice to have your own stock to sell at a convention or a pop-up event so mm -hmm. um, and also because this is such a small small scale project I really wasn't able to pay anyone what their illustration was actually worth I think after splitting all the profits everyone got like 20 bucks, <laughs> which is, you know, I wish I could give them what they deserve, which is 200, 300, 500 each. But uh, if everyone has the print file and the print specs, then if they want to, they can pursue like making more and selling more. Mm -hmm. Wow. So I have um, a couple more questions, but maybe I should open it up. Um, is there anybody here who wants to jump in and ask a question? Gibson? I'm, I'm curious, and I guess this is a question for everybody. What was the scariest part of the, the process between, uh, I guess, getting an agent to getting, getting published? I've got one. Drawing horses. <laughs> I'm like, I brought this on myself, but basically I'm doing a shape-shifting character who turns into animals. Um, and I was like, so Loki has a period in the mythology where he turns into a horse and gives birth. Um, and that horse he gives birth to has eight legs. So I was like, yeah, I'm going to draw that. <laughs> and I, I've never felt so underqualified in my life. <laughs> Sure, looks incredible too. To look at, look at <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess I guess I'll go next. Um, 
I guess the most scary part is not knowing how everything works in the industry. <laughs> like it, it came from like, you know, like a zine culture to like full on publishing where my agent is just like, you know, so-and-so really wants to work with you or like your pitch uh, packet was picked up and now we're doing like a house bid between so-and-so publisher. And I'm just like, I don't know what any of this means. Is this good or is this bad? Like, I, I'm sure it's good, but like, I, I don't know the like the, the severity of, of what's happening. And so for me, it's just like still learning the process um, and also making sure I don't make any mistakes or make, you know, do anything I would regret. I'm <laughs> just like turning down projects or, you know, cause you can't do everything at once. You have to like say no to certain projects, unfortunately, or, you know, get rejected if um, an author doesn't like your work for their project. So you just have to like handle that good. And I don't know, I'm just like scared of doing something wrong. <laughs> so I think I still have that fear even after like publishing two books. So, yeah. <laughs> Rosemary or Bingling, do you have a scary something? What what's scariest for you? Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot <laughs> uh, that's scary about publishing. I agree. It's it, there's a lot that I still don't understand, and at this point, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I feel like I've been doing it for ages. Um, it's stressful to sort of work from project to project and not entirely know what's coming next or even if I'm going to have a good idea. Um, so I tend to do a lot of stuff concurrently. Uh, this isn't quite scary, but I did, um, I had sort of, I was trying all these different venues and media and age ranges and stuff early on. And at some point I got into my head that, well, why can't I write a middle grade novel? So I wrote a middle grade novel that was heavily researched and was heavily rejected. <laughs> And, you know, that stuff just sort of happens. And um, it for all of this stuff in terms of, you know, hitting points where I feel like, oh, I don't know what's happening or I don't know if this is normal. Um, the, the godsend for me has been communicating with other uh, writers and pretty much all of them have had exactly the same experience. There aren't a lot of experiences in writing that are new, good and bad. Um, so that's always incredibly helpful is to have that have that feeling um but yeah so at this point i've gotten to the point where i send something out and it get reject gets rejected and i don't feel absolutely heartbroken and devastated i just sort of feel like oh you know oh well the vagaries of publishing um or maybe i can make that stronger but yeah i think that's been one of the things that's that's difficult i think for me this isn't so much something that scares me anymore but when I was first um, thinking about publishing and getting published and writing books and stuff, something that really intimidated me was, I have to do this as soon as possible. Like I have to, I have to, I have all these ideas in my head for different stories and I have to like finish one ASAP and push it out there ASAP. But I, I just, my brain doesn't work like that. Like I can't, writing is so hard <laughs> and writing a story from concept to completion is so hard and I still haven't done it for anything that isn't you know longer than a mini zine <laughs> and I think I, I definitely felt this pressure to like get published as soon as possible and throw something together even if it's not ready because some stories really need to bake in your head for years and that's normal and it, like should be allowed. I, I I was just really intimidated by that, but uh, something I really appreciate about my agent is they have been um, consistently like, take your time. <laughs> if people like your work now, they're gonna like it five years from now or 10 years from now. And if you need to take a hi hiatus for health reasons, uh, which I, I currently am like taking a break from making stuff for health stuff, uh, like people who were going to like your work in the first place, they're going to like it when it's been marinating for a while <laughs> and you don't have to kind of, I'm using this like cooking analogy, but you don't have to rush the process. You don't have to, you know, turn the heat on a high and bring it out before it's done baking. 
Um, I think that's something that was my biggest fear that I'm very glad is no longer like a pressing issue in my mind. I feel all of that. Thank you very much. So I, I have a follow-up question that's kind of related to what Gibson asked and related to something you said, Kat, which is about mistakes. I would love to hear from each of you what you feel like was the most valuable mistake that you've made in your career, like that you learned a lot from. I have, I have one that I, it still haunts me to this day. <laughs> um, signing up for a 200 page graphic novel and have it done within three months. That is not possible. <laughs> it's not. Um, it was like at the beginning of my career, it was my first book and I was very desperate and I'm just like, Ooh, that's a lot of money that, okay, I can do this. And it was like my first graphic novel and absolutely not. I <laughs> did not recommend it. Um, yeah, it, uh, my mental health and my happiness like declined severely. And so, um, I always, I, I didn't know that graphic novels would take, you know, one year, even more like a few, six years to make. So, um, yeah, even someone mentioned even the first draft is just like not even three months would like handle it. So now I give myself so much more time whenever I talk to my publish, um, my publisher and, and editor, I'm just like, okay, I know I can, you know, whip out a script, um, you know, four or five months for like the first draft. Let me add a couple, you know, more months just in case anything happens, you know, if my health declines, um, or something happens and I have a little bit more like leeway to kind of fall back on. Um, so yeah, uh, that I learned <laughs> not to do that again, but <laughs> yeah, that was uh, never again, never again. But thankfully I work with editors for understanding and they're just like, yeah, you need extension. Great, let's do that. So <laughs> that's always good. <laughs> but, uh, uh, did, so did you actually turn it in or did the yeah. project just fall apart? I did turn it in and it did not look good. Oh my <laughs> it God. didn't look good oh. at all. And at the at the expense of, of my whole team, because I had to hire a colorist who had to hire, you know, other colorists to help them out. And it was just like a whole mess. Um, and yeah, the, the editor would not budge to deadline. They're just like, because that's the thing, you know, uh, I didn't realize that, you know, when uh, a project is late, that also, um, uh, I guess affects the the printing time and you know the release uh, stuff and so uh, I you know didn't realize that was the case but yeah I don't know it was it was a very bad project but we eventually got it out and I kind of regret just taking that project in general mm -hmm. but it's, you learn from these mistakes yeah. Yeah. <laughs> do any of the other panelists have a mistake you're open to talking about I've gone. Um, so I did a web comic for a while and uh, I really enjoyed it and actually had Loki in it. It was kind of, um, it was all the gods, various gods from different pantheons living next door. Um, and I do not regret putting Jesus and God in there because I'm like, well, I, I, you know, come from a Catholic background. I, I know what that means. Um, but I did put um, Kali in from the, you know, from Hinduism. And um, I got a very kind, I guess calling in because he just came into my DMs about why that wasn't okay and I think because I was you know in that stage where I was very kind of like religion is nonsense I'm not gonna you know you know I'm not gonna whatever take it seriously but I think it was this guy talking to me from the perspective of this the colonialist element of um, basically secularizing Hinduism that has this long history that I was very ignorant of and Basically, that changed everything for me because it changed my approach to storytelling and kind of started this long, I guess, process of how you how you work out what's your story to tell. And I think it's that's not a process that ends. And I think it's one that you're always learning about, especially as you kind of learn from a more international community, because I was, you know, sort of I was in my like I, I knew what what the UK situation was. Um, but then thinking about it in the broader context. Um, so it's never, yeah, I can't ever say that I've learnt, but I'm learning. And mm -hmm. and I think I just, that was a real act of kindness for that that guy just like explaining it to me in 
in a lot of detail actually really didn't have to he could have just said take it down you know um but he was he was very kind and I think um in the the sort of children's book world there's a lot of I guess stuff that gets passed that doesn't that really shouldn't and um it sort of led to me being much more kind of involved in trying to change that um in whatever way I can because I worked in I used to work in house in children's publishers mm-hmm. um but yeah I think it just but also as a storyteller it changed changed my changed my approach and I guess there's just so many questions you need to ask yourself as a creator not even necessarily about whether but what's my story to tell but like even am I the best creator to tell this story you know is there someone else out there that could do a better job and kind of having a having that humility to know step back and you know that story will probably get told at some point you know if you're if you're not the only person who can tell it then sort of leave it in the wind you know and the right person will find it thank you for sharing that jenna i have a question mm-hmm. um first of all this is fantastic i, I love hearing everyone's uh, insights into their personal experiences um kat i really enjoyed uh you mentioning uh jamie Hernandez work, um, Education of Hopi Glass is one that I'm not too familiar with. I love Love and Rocket, so I'm gonna definitely look that one out. Um, but this question is for Bing Ling. Um, <clears throat> I believe you mentioned earlier that you had only had experience with short form comics um, before you jumped into your first graphic novel. Um, and you said there was a big learning curve and, and tremendous amount of challenges there. Could you be more specific? How, how did you go about meeting that challenge? Yeah, for sure. So uh, with the comics that I've been making before I did comics for publishing, it was all, you know, 100% personal work for myself, by me, for me, 100% on my own timeline, no like publication deadline, no like, no deadline of any sorts because I didn't do comics for homework either. Um, and my approach to conventions and stuff at the time was, it, I, I never worked with the thought of, I'm going to finish this zine so that I can sell it at the convention. It was always, the convention's here. What do I have that's ready to sell? <laughs> so working with timelines was, I think, the biggest thing about having such a big comic project um, because like it all has to get done. <laughs> There's so much of it and it all has to get done. And something that helped me a lot was uh, Carrie Peach has made a comics um, timeline organizer spreadsheet. And let me see if I can drop that in the chat actually, because what it is, is uh, of course everyone's process is different, but for most, um, for most comics, there's these specific steps. There's scripts, layouts, thumbnails, pencils, inks, colors, and then whatever other final steps you might have, whether that's like lettering, text, um, so on. And each of those stages takes a different, oh, did you link it? I think I found yes. it. Yeah. Yes, that's the one, thank you. Uh, that's the exact one that I used, and it is so, so handy because what you can do is you can plug in uh, layouts are very quick. Um, and actually, Rosemary did the layouts for Expedition Backyard, which was so, so helpful. <laughs> and I think that is a huge boon of working with a writer who is also an artist is they they know they know how long it takes <laughs> and they can help out, <laughs> which is great. And so with Carrie Peach's uh, comic deadline planner, you can say like, I can do 10 layouts in one day because they're really quick. And I want to work five days a week or I want to work two days a week because I have a day job and I can only do it on the weekends. Um, And then you say, I can do, let's see, like the example here says four thumbnails in one day, two pencils in one day, two inks, four colors, seven lettered pages. And that's, you know, maybe that's how Carrie Peach works. Everyone's different. Um, but you plug in these numbers, and then at the end, the spreadsheet says, uh, this is how long it's going to take you. And you can look at it and be like, that's not realistic. <laughs> or uh, I need to request an extension. 
or, you know, actually maybe I can't ink 20 comic pages in one day. Maybe I need to rethink this. <laughs> and I think having resources like that from other cartoonists is just so, so valuable. And I was relying on it heavily for uh, the process on Expedition Backyard. That's perfect. Thank you so much. Um, Kat, do you have anything to add about um, production timelines? Uh, no, where was this link when I <laughs> was working on that first project? Um, no, it's, it's, it's very, very helpful. Um, no, I guess, I guess, um, you know, there's gonna be a lot of learning curves and you're gonna learn a lot about your process at the end of your first project. And then that will be a lot easier for your next one, but just, um, just don't, I guess, mistakes are going to be happening and it's it's fine as long as you're okay health-wise and you're able to meet your deadlines but also um a few i guess tips about uh that i learned from making comics is just like yeah adding more time for your deadlines um just in case anything were to happen um don't be afraid to talk to your editor or agent about needing more time because that was my mistake as well in the beginning just like I want to impress this editor and show them that I can do this work and finish this book uh, but I am afraid uh, of you know asking that so um, don't be afraid to request more time if needed or if you have any help need any help with something by all means they can help you uh, with that process and also um <laughs> there's like a there's gonna be a lot of mistakes happening but like for me it was consistency it was like uh you know I I would draw a character draw um drawn in one outfit uh in one scene and then the next page they're you know have a different outfit and so um I had a lot of consistency issues with my like uh, pages and so um to expedite the process or help you uh definitely have a lot of model sheets for like pages uh of like what the characters are wearing or what, what the layout looks like. Just do a lot of planning before you work on your comic because that helps you a lot <laughs> later on <laughs> in terms of consistency. So that was my issue. But yeah, it's stuff like I learned from the first project. I'm like, okay, it's gonna be a lot easier when I work on the next book. So um, yeah, mistakes are gonna happen, but it's mm -hmm. good to refer to these resources that people have online um, that is really helpful. So yeah. That's I would also work. say to that, oh, sorry. Oh, go, go ahead. Um, that your um your you know editor you work with or your designer you work with often will be able to help you with that kind of thing. So mine's offered now to do a little sheet where basically uh it's like all the characters with labels being like Loki's t-shirt doesn't have the L filled in. This hair should be like this, so that you've got kind of that like little cue when you're drawing it. Like I've got Thor in mine and his hair looks like a bit of toothpaste, like it comes down up, up like that. And um, and I just need to remember toothpaste hair, toothpaste hair. So all these little, yeah, basically, but often like your publishing team will help, be able to help as well. Um, basically, it'll be quicker for them if you don't make mistakes. So it's in their interest to make, make things speed along. Yeah, can I say too, daily schedules are really, really important. I mean, early on in the process, what I did was take my word count divided by the number of work days and write that much each day, which is not the best way to do it, but it's one way to do it. Um, so I have a, uh, I wanted to mention about injuries. I've had a long history of injuries. I had to have um, cubital tunnel surgery on both sides. And that's why it's partly why I pivoted to writing because I couldn't do the long periods of drawing um, that I wanted to. Now I'm, I'm much better, but it took a long time to figure out what was wrong. So what I find really helpful is, and this might you know, be really irritating for a lot of you, but I have a, a website that rings a bell every 15 minutes. You can set the time, but it every time it rings, I get up and stretch. And every 15 is a lot. You might need more, you might need less, but it, yeah, it has completely changed my physical health just to have this this annoying bell that goes off. I'll I'll paste it in the. I, there are lots of programs that do this, but I'll paste the link that I use in the chat. Um, that is great. So, yeah, yeah. Your health is more important than you know than any anything you produce, and sometimes I have to remind myself of that. But mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Also, wrist exercises after drawing so many pages continually for like a whole month. Uh, it's very important to do do those because that helps you a lot as well. I think as a as a um, as you know, 
in comics, we need to be more understanding of injuries in general. And I, and also, you know, I'm lucky in that mine were eventually mostly fixed. That's not the case of everybody. And so I think there just needs to be more, more resources and more understanding about, about injuries. Cause we're like musicians. We get weird, fine little injuries that mm -hmm. need, need to be addressed. Yeah. I think it is really easy to forget that art making is manual labor and whether like, no matter what kind of process you use, if it's digital or traditional or a mix of both, like you are using your hands and your hands are your tools and you have to clean your tools <laughs> and maintain them and make sure that you don't uh, damage them permanently because you only get two hands. <laughs> One of my favorite uh, quotes of all time is from a producer and director at Nintendo, uh, Shigeru Miyamoto, but he, uh, let me see, what did he say? He said, a delayed game is eventually good, but a rushed game is forever bad. <laughs> and that's kind of, you know, that's speaking specifically to the crunch culture that's in a lot of the video game industry, but crunch culture is not specific to video games, it is very present in publishing. And it is always better to negotiate for extensions and advocate for yourself. And like, it doesn't matter if a book takes you five, 10 years to make, if you break your body making it, then what was the point? And I would say from, from working inside publishing, schedules are often lies. <laughs> like they don't tell the creator the real schedule they'll be like they've clearly factored in like six weeks for this seven weeks for that so it's always worth pushing back because there probably is time yeah I learned that early on and I was kind of frustrated because I was always like you know a grade chasing kid and so I was like oh I have to hit this deadline absolutely and there was one early project where I hit it even almost early because I was just so panicky and they said oh what do you mean like we we built in a couple extra months and I was like why didn't you tell me <laughs> so it's true they often do build in time because they assume that you'll blow past your deadline and be nice if I'd known that now I do <laughs> basically yeah. not missing not hitting your deadlines is so normal Yeah, and the, the other thing is that the dates that are in contracts, depending on the publisher, but with many publishers, those dates are not really, it's not like it's, you haven't signed in blood about those those dates that are in the contract. Yep. They also don't tell you that um, like editorial notes also take a few months, uh, depending on on the publisher too. So like coming from like a DIY mindset, I'm just like, oh yeah, if I can create a zine within like, you know, a few weeks, I can definitely whip up a book in like three months. And no, that's not the case. There's a lot of back and forth between you and the editor and changes. And so sometimes it takes, you know, editorial process takes about like a month or so. So like, it really depends on the project and who you're working with, but yeah, they, they don't, I feel like they don't really factor that time sometimes, but <laughs> yeah. It takes a while. <laughs> well, everybody, I hope you all go to the bookstore Thanks. this afternoon and you buy Miss Kinsas and Expedition Backyard and Loki, A Bad God's Guide to Being Good. <laughs> and uh, spread the word about these amazing books. I, I hope you saw, we posted, you know, in inside the Mighty Networks community and on the blog on Kids Coming Tonight. All of them are amazing. And now that you've met the creators, I'm sure you're even more excited about them. So um, thank you. Thank you, Kat. Thank you, Binglin. Thank you, Lu Louie. And thank you, Rosemary, for coming and talking Thanks to us. So if much. everybody could unmute yeah, yourself you. and say thank you. 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 Thank you.